Namaste. Well, so here we are taking up the Mandukya Upanishad again. After a long detour in uh, another series through the Brihararanyaka Upanishad, discussing the levels of dream and deep sleep consciousness. Now, this is not the astral plane, huh? <laughs> Just to make it perfectly clear, that's an invention. That's, that's a fabrication made by the theosophists to kind of group all the different levels of subtle worlds into one. But that's not really appropriate because the qualifications for the different levels of the subtle worlds are, I mean, tremendously varied. The subtle worlds can include the so-called downward heavenly planets, the planets of the demons. You definitely don't want to go there. I mean, you know, you think this world is exploitative and violent and so on. Whew. Um, those are like hellish worlds. And then there are the hells themselves, which are also subtle worlds, parts of the uh, so-called astral world, which is basically all imagination. Dreams. It's just that some of the dreams are of very different quality than others, of very different lengths than others. And what's most interesting about dreams, svapna consciousness, is that it acts as a way to understand or calibrate our knowledge of the consequences of our actions. Because every day when we go into sleep at night, we bring with us the impressions of the day's activities. And then we experience in dreams what is going to be the karmic result of those activities in the next life. So if we experience distressing dreams, let's say, uh, it means that something during the day has triggered a karma from a previous life that could take us into a very uncomfortable or hellish situation in the next life. So this is a good way to judge one's overall spiritual progress or, or status, that if one's dreams are confused, uh, or if there's a lot of dreams, you know, all night basically, or if uh, your dreams are disturbing or violent or scary or, you know, anything weird, you have some work to do. You, you have to clean up your act. You have to, like, get your sadhana together, you know. You have to purify your mind, basically. And the best way to do that is with mantras. We went in the Shiva Purana series, we went deep into the five-syllable mantra, Namah Shivaya, Aung Namah Shivaya. This is really the most powerful mantra. Shiva is not like other gods. He doesn't demand, you know, that you follow certain rules and regulations, and that you uh, meet certain criteria. He accepts everyone. His love is boundless. He is very open-minded. He's not selective. He's not protective. He, he's not exclusive, like, you know, like Vishnu, let's say who only accepts service in the mode of goodness. But Shiva, it, I mean, he's wild himself. But the, the offshoot of this is that he's comfortable with us being wild too. <laughs> so, and of course, Ma, you know, Shakti, is wild herself. And this being Navaratri season, it's a, a good thing to think about her glorification as well, which we cover in several different series, especially the Mahashodashi Mantra series, which is the most powerful mantra for Shakti. So if you don't feel qualified or disposed to approach Shiva, do approach Shakti. 
She's the universal mother. And like Shiva, she accepts everyone. And she will purify you and bring you to the lotus feet of Shiva. That is what she does. <laughs> she will recommend you when you're ready. And then Shiva will accept you immediately. So these are things you can do to sanctify and purify your mind. And also, in our series on dreams and deep sleep, we went into the practices of lucid dreaming and lucid deep sleep, which are also well covered by the Buddha in his teachings on the jhanas and so on. But this is from the point of view of Raja Yoga. And Raja Yoga means meditation with the ultimate goal of realizing the emptiness. So now... Let us come back into Mandukya Upanishad, and we're going to cover verse 5 and Shankara's commentary on it. Uh, and this one deals specifically with Sushupti. That state is deep sleep, where the sleeper does not desire any enjoyable thing and does not see any dream. The third quarter is Pragna, who has deep sleep as his sphere, in whom everything becomes undifferentiated, who is a mass of mere consciousness, who abounds in bliss, who is surely an enjoyer of bliss, and who is the doorway to the experience of the dream and waking states. This last clause is very important, and Shankara will expound on it in his Tika, but I just wanted to mention that a doorway, you know, goes both ways. You can go in or out. <laughs> and in this case, the Upanishad is describing Sushupti as a doorway that goes out from the root consciousness, Turiya, or Brahman, into the realm of dreams and sense perceptions. That's considered going out extroversion. And, of course, the danger in these states is that they're dualistic and they're full of all kinds of illusions, such as one is an individual, one is a doer, one is responsible for his actions, there's cause and effect, and so on and so on and so on. There's a lot of suffering. So, basically, sushupti is an escape from suffering, because in Sushupti there are no objects. One is still conscious, one is still an individual, but there's no cause and effect, and there's certainly no suffering, only enjoyment. And we've made the point several times that we need deep sleep, and sleep research has shown that without it, if one is woken up when entering deep sleep, it has very deleterious effect on our health and sanity. So now let's take a look at Shankara's Tika. Since sleep, consisting in the unawareness of reality, is a common feature of the two states of waking and dream, where there are the presence and absence, respectively, of perceptible gross objects, therefore the adverbial clause where the sleeper, etc., is used in order to keep in view the state of deep sleep. Or, since sleep, consisting in the unawareness of reality, is equally present in all the three states, deep sleep is being distinguished by that clause from the earlier two states. Yatra, in which place or at which time? Suptaha, the sleeping man. Napashyati does not see. Kamchana svapnam, any dream. Nakamayate does not desire. Kamchana kamam, any enjoyable thing. For in deep sleep there does not exist, as in the two earlier states, either dream, consisting in the perception of things otherwise than what they are, or any desire. This is tat sushuptam, the state of deep sleep. He who has got this state of deep sleep as his sphere is sushuptastanaha. 
He is said to be Eki Bhutaha, undifferentiated, since the whole host of duality that are diversified as the two states of waking and dream, and are but modifications of the mind, become non discernible in that state without losing their aforesaid characteristics, just as the day together with the phenomenal world becomes non discernible under the cover of nocturnal darkness. Whoo! Shankaracharya is certainly very eloquent. And he is an excellent Sanskrit author. And he has put together a very complicated grammatical structure here. But what it means is actually what we just went over, that in all three conditioned consciousness states, Sushupti, Svapna, and Jagrat, one is asleep. What does that mean? One is not cognizant of reality. What is reality? Brahman, Turiya, the fourth state, which we'll examine in the next few verses. So this is very significant. Most people think waking consciousness is reality, and dreams and deep sleep are not reality. Well, that's true in a certain sense because the objects perceived in waking consciousness do have a certain continuity, whereas dreams are here and gone in one night. There is no continuity from one night to the next in dreams. So what to speak of deep sleep where there are no objects at all, no experiences at all, no impressions? But in all three cases, one is simply aware of modifications of the mind. That is a dream. Huh? A modification of the mind is a dream. And this reminds me of the second verse in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, where he says that yoga is the cessation of mental modifications. He says, Chitta Vritti Nirodha. Chitta is the mind. Vritti is modifications. Nirodaha means complete cessation. Chitta Vritti Nirodaha is actually the same as what is described in this verse, that the modifications of the mind are going on in all three states of conditioned consciousness. So the idea is to make us aware that what we experience in these states is not the reality. So we should distance ourselves from it. We should not identify with it. We should not think that, oh, this is real. My body is real. My possessions are real. My thoughts are real, and so on. Language, part of the mind, is another transformation of the mind stuff, another chittavritti. Uh, so, at least in Sushupti, the mind is quiet. There's no language. It is still a little bit transformed from its original state. Because one thinks, I am, as an individual, and one thinks, I am not doing anything, I am not experiencing anything. Uh, or maybe one doesn't think it in verbal terms, but one certainly experiences it. So that is the advantage of this state of sushupti, and that is why what samadhi is, is really the deliberate attainment of sushupti with awareness. When we go into sushupti with awareness, then we realize, oh, there's nothing here. There's nothing happening. There is nothing, only emptiness. But I am here. I am perceiving the emptiness. So even though in the beginning, when one enters sushupti with awareness, one experiences the state of neither perception nor non-perception, because even though one is perceptic, 
In other words, one could perceive things. There are no things to perceive. So it's kind of hard to tell whether one is perceptic or not. But then one realizes after some time, oh, I am here. I am perceiving that there's nothing to perceive. <laughs> so this is actually the beginning of self-realization. And it's just one more small step from there to Turiya. As such, conscious experiences that are but vibrations of the mind in the waking and dream states become solidified, as it were. This state is called pragyanaghanaha, a mass of consciousness, since it is characterized by the absence of discrimination. It is a mass of consciousness, like everything appearing as a mass, by becoming indistinguishable under nocturnal darkness. From the use of the word eva, merely or especially, it follows that there is nothing of a separate class other than consciousness. And he is anandamaya, full of joy, his abundance of joy being caused by the absence of the misery involved in the effort of the mind vibrating as the objects and their experiencer. But he is not bliss itself, since the joy is not absolute. Just as in common parlance, one remaining free from effort is said to be happy, or anandabhuk, an experiencer of joy, so this one too is called anandabhuk, for by him is enjoyed this state that consists in extreme freedom from effort. In accordance with the Vedic text, this is its supreme bliss, Brihadaranyaka 4.3.32. We just went over that verse in this video of the previous series. So this is wonderful. This is why everybody loves a good sleep, isn't it? Don't you just enjoy relishing that extreme absence of effort? Well, there's nothing to do, nothing to see, nothing to be. And it's correct what he states that the uh, states of waking and dreaming are exhausting because of this constant oscillation of the mind between the self and the object, the subject and the object of consciousness. And this takes place many times a second, but it does entail an effort, and that effort has been detailed by the Buddha in his sutta on the root sequence, which we've gone over here. So the root sequence is like a computational subroutine in the mind that executes on every single impression received from the senses. And since we receive every second dozens or hundreds or maybe thousands of these impressions, the mind is working hard during waking and dreams. But in deep sleep, all this stops. There's peace. The peace that passeth all understanding. Because understanding is a function of the mind as well. A transformation of the mind, a citta vritti. So when that goes away, all effort stops. One is completely free. And this is a kind of enlightenment. This is a kind of liberation. It's called fourth path or arhan in the Buddha's lexicon. So this is a very important thing to cultivate. And like I said, we went over that in the previous video, how to cultivate this uh, sushupti with awareness or lucid sushupti. <laughs> So let's go on with the purports. He is Cheto Mukaha, since he is the doorway to the consciousness of the experiences in the dream and waking states. Or he is called Cheto Mukaha because consciousness, appearing as empirical experience, is his doorway or entrance leading to the states of dream and waking.
He is called Pragnaha, Pragna, consciousness par excellence, since in him alone is there the knowledge of the past and the future and of all things. Even though lying in deep sleep, he is called Pragna, conscious, because of his having been so earlier in the two former states of dream and waking. Or he is called conscious, since he alone is possessed of the peculiar characteristics of mere, undiversified consciousness, whereas the other two have diversified knowledge as well. Pragna, as described, is the third quarter. Remember, back in the beginning of Mandukya Upanishad, there is a mantra describing the four quarters of Brahman. And of course, we have our good old chart <laughs> of the four states of consciousness, which are also the four quarters of Brahman, as described in Mandukya Upanishad. Now, the difference between waking and dreaming and deep sleep is that in deep sleep, sushupti, the consciousness is not diversified. That is, it doesn't oscillate between subject and object like it does in waking and dreams. So this is the reason why there is this extreme feeling of peacefulness, rest, relaxation, and recharge in sushupti. And this is also why it is an absolute necessity to recover from the efforts of maintaining conditioned consciousness. So this is the wonderful state of sushupti, wherein one has all knowledge, knowledge of past, present, and future. Why does uh, Shankar say this? Because it certainly would appear on the surface that we have no knowledge at all in sushupti. But the ignorance in sushupti is only when it's experienced during sleep. If one approaches sushupti with awareness, in other words, as samadhi, or as uh, the fourth state, or, the, or as the eighth jhana in Buddha's system, one indeed has all-pervading knowledge, because in this state, basically, one becomes united with Shiva. Now, we haven't talked much about this because it's very deep, very esoteric. Because in the Devi Kalotara Tantra, which, guess what, we have a series on. <laughs> Shiva recommends meditation on the void. What is the void? Sushupti. Or the eighth jhana, nothingness, or neither perception nor non-perception. And if you actually start to cultivate this, you'll find it's very wonderful. It's very healing, just like deep sleep at night. So one should cultivate this, and one should actually expand one's experience of it until it becomes a natural refuge for the mind. And so if one does this, it will lead to the supreme peace, the supreme awareness, and the supreme enlightenment. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya. <laughs>